the morning, if you will. Stand, turn in your hymn book to hymn number 208. And that's open with love divine, all love excelling. <laughs> They love you. 
Uh, I welcome again everyone, uh, and I hope uh, that you will be blessed by being here. Now, announcements have not too many announcements, uh, unless I'm willing to call to see if anybody has some. But there's no Wednesday night service. You know, uh, we usually have the, the Bible, uh, Bible study, prayer meeting, the Bible study, but the pastor and his family is going to be gone. Now remember, June the 9th is the Father's Day banquet. And I hope all you ladies have decided on what you're going to fix for us men. You know, like that, yeah, I tried to recommend something, but said I couldn't. You don't remember me last time and y'all didn't know what y'all wanted. We could tell you. And you said, no. <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> I remember. I remember. Because we had to live. Well, it ain't him now. The people didn't, uh, uh, there wasn't not too many people signing on what they were going to bring. So I, I made a suggestion well, the men say what they want. And uh, believe it or not, I said, she's a teacher. She don't I think because the women didn't get to make any suggestions. Uh, the women didn't get to make any suggestions. <laughs>
homes and the nursing homes. And, uh, and uh, Frank here, he's got a the problem. Uh, Frank and Todd are, are, are friends and loved ones that, that have cancer. Or, uh, we, we all know that that's uh, it's a terrible disease and all that difficult things that we go through. But just keep these in, in, in our prayers. Uh, anything else? You might have prayers? I have a prayer. My nephew was in Jacksonville, Florida for a brain tumor. He's undergoing radiation treatment. That has worked and he is home to do well. Right. And I, I like to say, praise the Lord for bringing my son and my granddaughter home. Father, we, we, we now ask that you, that you be with us.
with the uh, with, 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 with the sermon today, Father. We ask that, that, that you give us the hearts to receive the message that's prepared. Lord, let us always worship and give praise to you. It's in the name of Jesus we ask you.
Satan. Looks like an angel, too. I guess we could interview uh, Brother Jason about this thing you see. <laughs> My name is Daniel Spade. And my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I apologize for getting emotional. But you know, one thing I know is that when I die, I'm going to heaven. And it's not because of anything I've done. Because of what he done. Amen, brother. God bless you. Give me a few minutes. I'll get over this, I promise. <laughs> but while I'm getting over it, if you'll turn to Exodus in chapter 14. Get this ready. Sometimes I like to give a testimony, but obviously. I'm not going to be able to do that today, or I'll just be a blubbering idiot up here, so y'all bear with me. It's not that I want to brag on my sins or anything, but I was a rotten, filthy human being when I got saved. If there was anybody on earth that didn't deserve it, it was me. I praise God that He saved me and put me in ministry. I praise God that I ain't got over it yet. I know that when a person gets saved, you know, for some reason I was under the impression that when I got saved, that life was going to be good. You know, when I get saved, oh my goodness, man, because the, the way that preacher was preaching, I'm going to tell you, and, and forgive me if I can't stand behind my pulpit, I get a lot of nervous energy. But the way that preacher was preaching, I was under the impression that when you turn your life over to Jesus Christ, that everything's going to be good from here on out. I mean, look, my truck's going to run better. My bills are going to be paid now. Everything's going to be good. Now, that's not the reason why I got saved. I want you to understand that whenever I got saved, it was because the Holy Spirit put me under conviction. And I was a very, I mean, life was good to me. I had a good job. Everything was fine. Everything was good. I was fair. I mean, I, I didn't have any complaints with life. Um, life was good to me. But I realized uh, whenever I went to church, the Holy Spirit started dealing with me and I went to church. And I realized that I was a sinner, and the reason why I got saved is simply this. I did not want to spend eternity in hell. And if there was somebody that thought enough of me to leave heaven and come down here and pay for those sins for me so that I don't have, then, they, then what option do I have but to honor Him by spending my eternity in heaven with Him? That's why I got saved. But I was under the impression that life was going to be good after that. Well, I soon found out just a few months after that that my wife did not want to uh, live her life with a Christian. My wife left me and divorced me because I went to church three times a week. Uh, she did not like the idea that I was a Bible thumper. Now, mind you, I did not uh, uh, run my wife off. I, I mean, uh, look, we quit doing drugs, I quit smoking, I quit drinking, I quit cussing, I quit everything you could imagine quit doing because God saved me from that. But I did not expect my wife to become a Christian. I witnessed to her, but she did not want to be married to what she said, a preacher. Well, I had never even preached a sermon in my life. And so whenever she left, I thought, well, I guess i got free reign to be a preacher now. And the Lord opened up the doors and... Friends, I just, I just praise God for that. I told you all that just to simply say this. I always thought that life was going to be good. And I'm going to tell you, life has never been harder on me than since I got saved. I want to tell you, it's a, uh, it takes a man or a woman to be a Christian in this filthy world today. You want to be a Christian, you want to be sold out to God, it takes a real man of God. It takes
takes a real woman of God to be a Christian in this world today. And I know here recently we've been, we've been, uh, this world has been facing a lot of battles. And so the, the message that I want to preach to you today comes out of just a couple of words out of this uh, that I'm going to read. It's just a couple of words that I that just jumped out at me and just kind of stuck with me. And I want to read this to you and try to paint a picture to you. Now, whenever I read uh, the Bible, I have a, uh, it's not, I use the word bad habit, it's not a bad habit, but I have, uh, in my mind, I get these visual pictures of what it might have been like. And it, and, it, and it sometimes it haunts me because at night I'll dream things about what I read in the Bible the day before. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, that, might, that would have been horrible. You know, so whenever I'm reading the Bible, I, I kind of picture things and try to picture how, how it would have been. And so as we're reading in Exodus chapter 14 and verse 6, uh, now, leading up to this part of the Bible, I, I know you've heard the story, I know you've read the Bible um, about how the Israelites are in Egypt at this point. And they've been in Egypt for 400 years. They've been there for 400 years. Now, for the most part, I believe that these uh, Israelites and Jews did not really, weren't real familiar with God. Now, I believe that they had heard stories about their great, 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 great grandfather and about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all these. Um, I believe they had heard these stories, and, but I don't believe that they were really sold out to God. Uh, the reason why I believe that is because they were in bondage. That's why they were in bondage, is because they had forgot who God was. Now, I do believe that some of them might have been going through the rituals of, of uh, their little um, uh, prayers and stuff, maybe, but I don't believe there was any of them sold out to God. And that's why God called Moses to come get them out of the promised land. Now, there comes a point where, you know, the ten plagues, you know, Moses comes over here and gets them out, and then uh, leads them, and they get up to the Red Sea, and now they're at the Red Sea. Moses parts the Red Sea, and then they walk across on dry ground. I mean, there's a lot, a lot of good preaching going on in there, but they walk across on dry ground to get on the other side, and they, they can see, this whole time before they cross the sea, they see uh, the Egyptians coming towards them. And this is where we pick up in the Bible right here at this point. And it says in verse 6 of chapter 14 in Exodus, and uh, now bear with me because I noticed this, uh, your, your uh, uh, bulletin said uh, NIV. I'm reading out the King James Bible, so there's some uh, differences there. You'll know why. And it says, And he made ready his chariot. Talking about Pharaoh. It says, And he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. And he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went out with a high hand. But the Egyptians pursued after them, and all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them, encamping them by the sea. Piharoth before Beelzebub. Now, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, so bear with me if that's not correct. And the Bible says in verse 10, And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. Now if you would, skip down to me, uh, with me to verse 24. And it came to pass that in the morning, watch, the Lord looked to the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians. And took off their chariot wheels, that they dragged them heavily, so that the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the sea, that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength, when the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled against it. And the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you so much for an opportunity to be here. Father, I pray, Lord God, that you would just come and fellowship with us this morning in this church building. Lord, I pray that your word would be spoken through you, Lord God. Father, I, I look at the prayer request, uh, Lord, and, and these people, to be honest, Lord, I don't know these people. I don't know their personal um, situations, Lord. And, and so these prayer requests aren't personal to me, Lord God. But Father, I know they're personal to you. 
I know I have personal things going on in my life, and I would want uh, all the Christians I know to pray for me, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you would just march through this building and see these prayers and these people and all their requests, Lord, and that you would meet their needs as you see fit. Father, I pray for Brother Frank that you give him some good rest. Lord, that you'd just take care of him, Lord, that he would be uh, just blessed by your presence over there where he's at. And Lord, anybody he may come contact with over there, Lord, may know that they're in the presence of a man of God, Lord God, that you would just witness to them through him, Lord. And Father, I beg you for your presence this morning in this building with us, Lord. May your word be preached, Lord, which open up our minds that we may accept it in a way that would be fitting in, to you, Lord. Lord, we love you, Father. We thank you. And of course, we only ask this in the name of our perfect Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, these, these Israelites have been, they, they were born into bondage. They were born into slavery. And so, all they know is one way of life. Getting up in the morning and getting beaten and having to work and just doing what the taskmasters tell them to do. What the Egyptians tell them to do. Now, that's all they know. And all of a sudden, Moses convinces them, God convinces them to leave uh, their comfort of their home and go into the wilderness with him. And they get to the Red Sea and then, oh my goodness, they see the Egyptians come and fixing to kill them and they just start freaking out. And for probably the first time in 400 years, they turned to God and they started praying to God. You know, I'm telling you folks, it's in your darkest hour that God works the best. It's in your darkest hour when God works the best. I'm going to tell you, just before God let them Israelites go, you know that there was a plague of darkness put on the land. And right after that, that's when the death angel passed over. There was a lot of death in that, in that area. I'm going to tell you something, friends. It's in your darkest hour that God works the best. And so what happened is uh, they start marching across. Uh, Moses touches the Red Sea. It opens up, and they start marching across. And the Egyptians start following after them. When they get on to the other side, now these Egyptians are crossing that Red Sea. God, it's, it's in the morning time now. And the Bible says that in the morning, God looked through that pillar of fire. I don't know why I can picture this. I can picture God in heaven. And He's got that pillar of fire and that cloud that He, that he guides them through. And He looks down through that pillar of fire. It's early in the morning. And He sees those chariots down there crossing the Red Sea. And He just... Knocked all the wheels off the chariots at the same time. I'm talking about a, a, a mechanic's nightmare. I mean, all the chariots just break down at the same time. And the Egyptians were smart enough to know, listen, we need to quit chasing these guys. That's the Lord. Their God is stronger than our God. He's trying to hinder us, man. We need to turn around. But at that point, the decision was too late. And God closed up the Red Sea and, and killed all the Egyptians and their chariots and their horses and horsemen. And, and, and the Bible says, when the morning appeared and the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. In the morning. And that's kind of what I wanted to speak to you about this morning is when the morning appeared. You know, sometimes it seems like we're just waiting for morning time to get here. You ever been really, really sick and you just couldn't wait till morning time. Because it just seems like when the morning breaks in the morning, it's just you feel better in the morning. Even you may not, your temperature may still be uh, 105 and you still may be sick to your stomach and your feet may still hurt, your knees may still, but there's just something about the morning time that seems better. When the Bible talks about darkness and talks about nighttime, it's always in an evil way. The Bible speaks a lot about darkness, which is where uh, all, all the evil flees. That's the reason why when my sons were growing up, uh, they come home 2 o'clock in the morning. I told him, I said, listen, you're not living in this house. Come home 2 o'clock in the morning. You know, you don't need to be out after dark. Just, oh, well, we weren't doing nothing. Um, well, yeah, I don't believe you, but even if you wasn't doing nothing, you're hanging around with a bunch of uh, evil people that's hanging out in the middle of the night. It's evil out there at nighttime. You don't need to be out there at nighttime. My wife last night stayed up all night long with a bad knee. She's never had bad knees. The last three days, she's got a bad knee. All night long, she's out there and crying and crying and crying all night long because she can't sleep with her bad knees. She couldn't even get up and walk on it this morning. Something about morning time. Boy, when that morning broke this morning, she fell out like a rock. You know? So what is it about morning time? I don't know, but I'm just telling you, in the morning time, there's something about morning time that makes you feel better when morning gets here. In Acts in chapter 27, verse 29, the Bible says, Then fearing, lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. You know, Paul was arrested. And he was on his way to Rome. And he told those guys, Listen, we don't need to get on this boat. We don't need to go right now because uh, I perceive something bad is going to happen. 
And so they got on the ship anyway, and they left Creek, and they took off, and it got a bad storm. The Bible says that for 14 days, that storm was so fierce that the men on that ship wouldn't even eat. They cast everything they owned overboard trying to save the ship. And it got to a point that it was so bad that they cast all their anchors out of the ship. And the Bible says that they wished for the day. They were just waiting for morning time to come so that you can see what's going on. Something about morning time is a lot better than night time. And friends, I'm here to tell you that morning's coming. Our morning is coming. Our day is coming. The next morning, after they cast their four anchors, Paul comes up to him and he gave him the good news. He said, listen guys, guess what? Lord told me last night that the ship's going to sink. We're all going to hit the water today. But listen, not a one of your heads. Going to, we're all going to swim to shore. Everything's going to be okay. Nobody's going to die. The good news is, you're not going to stay out here and drown. We're all going to make it. How it's going to happen, I don't know. But Paul delivered the good news in the morning. Friends, I'm going to tell you something. It's easy to deliver good news to somebody in their darkest hour. I'm not going to sit here and try to bore you to death with a bunch of details, which I, I love details. I love getting you know theological or trying to or because it, 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 it sometimes it you know makes you look smart when you stay up the night before and you get all this verses together and you, you give a bunch of facts and you actually all you do is you look up on a computer and you type in some words and it gives you a bunch of numbers and stuff you know and, and it makes you look smart and stand behind a pulpit. but I'd love to do that but I don't have enough time to do that today. So all I want to do is I just want to kind of compare the uh, the world then to the world now just with a, with a couple of things. Basically, Egypt then, and I'm just going to make a couple of uh, points real quick, but it, we think that things was a lot different back in those days. And I know technology now is a lot better than it was back in the Egyptian days. I, I know we got cell phones, we got, I mean, all kinds of computers. I mean, it's amazing um, the things that they didn't have. But basically, things, so there was a lot of things that was the same. You know, the Egyptians, for instance, made it harder on God's people. They wanted to suppress God's people. They didn't want God to be involved in His people. You know? And so they tried to suppress the people. And you know, it ain't no different today. I'm going to tell you right now, the world is trying to suppress Christianity. They're going to make it harder and harder on us to serve God. They're going to make it worse and worse. You go out there in the street today, and you go, up, you go stand in the red light in town up here in Slidell. You go stand here in the town, and you go hand out tracts and see how long it takes somebody to come over there and tell you that you can't hand out tracts in the red light because it's hindering traffic. I'm going to tell you something. Now, you get a fireman standing out there with a boot and don't, trying to get you to donate money. They can stand there all day long. Amen. They can, they can collect all the money they want to, and that's fine, okay? No, no, nothing against firemen. I'm just saying, the world has something against Christians. You know, our government is trying to find a way to where religion and Christianity is uh, uh, no longer a tax-free organization. So they're trying to find a way to where they can uh, make churches pay taxes now, make people pay taxes. The IRS targets people and targets pastors. In churches now for uh, for you know, to review the records to make sure that they're paying taxes correctly. So the world's making it harder and harder for a, man. They're, they're taking uh, insurance companies. Our administration's taking insurance companies and making uh, the church's insurance companies pay for abortions that we preach against. That's crazy. I don't understand that. Pharaoh hated God. Pharaoh wanted to control everything. It's no different today. Our government is godless, and our government wants to. Uh, control everything. It's no different. Let me. If our president, if we had a guy that became president, and he allowed, say, Jews to come to the White House and hold a Jewish Pride Month in the White House all month long, and we just thought, and, and he supported you, and he told the Jewish people, he said, "Listen, I'm sorry the way." that uh, you've been treated over the last few years. Our laws should, are against Jews. We're going to make better laws to support the Jews. We're going to, we're going to make our insurance companies uh, take care of the Jews. We're going to make our government take care of the Jews. Man, you would think that our president liked Jews. And if our president became president and he said, listen, um, Christians, I know y'all celebrate Christianity every year. You have a Christian Pride Month. Why don't y'all come to the White House and have a Christian Pride Month? Amen? 
And what we're going to do is we're going to change the laws for all the Christians. And he gave a big speech and just edified the Christians, just patted the Christians on the back and just gave the Christians everything. I mean, just was just real good to the Christians. You would think that our president was, was either a Christian or that he loved Christians. Well, what would you think if our president said, okay, I'll tell you what. I know every year y'all have a gay pride month. Why don't y'all have your gay pride month in the White House over here? Why don't we do that? Why don't we just have a gay pride month in the White House? And, and I'll tell you what I'm going to do. We're going to uh, support the gays. We're going to make sure the insurance company pays for all your problems. We're going, to, we're going to implement laws where you can't... What would you think? You would think that our country is going to hell in the handbasket. That's what you would think. And that's where we're headed because that's exactly what happened. That's what our government supports. Our government, not just that, but I mean multitude of things. So what I, the, the point I'm trying to make is that our government does not support Christians. Our government suppresses Christianity today. And it's going to get worse, and it's going to get worse, and it's going to get worse. It'll be a time, just like in some other countries, it's illegal to serve God. You go to some countries, you can die for handing out tracts and preaching the Word of God. It's, it's, you can. And it happens today. And one day, it'll happen here. Political corruption. Back in, in, in the days of Egypt, let me tell you something. Those people over there, if you had a lot of money, you were innocent. If you were broke, you're guilty. I'm going to tell you, it's the same thing today. I've had to, listen, something, it aggravated me so bad, I got a speeding ticket in Buda, Texas one time for doing uh, 65 and a 55. And that aggravated me so good. And I, I, man, I, I got so mad at that policeman. And I'm sitting there looking at my ticket. I'm sitting there, that ain't right. You got somebody else. I'm trying to convince him. You, this is for somebody else. It wasn't me. And don't get me wrong. I probably deserve a ticket for speeding all the other times. So I'm not saying I'm innocent, but that time, that one time, I was innocent. So he writes me a ticket, and come to find out, there is no 55 speed limit through that whole town. There's not a 55 speed limit anywhere in there. That town goes from a 35 mile an hour speed limit to a 65 mile an hour speed limit outside of town. And that's a speed limit. So I couldn't have been doing 65 and a 55. And plus, when he wrote my uh, car down, he said that I was driving a blue Chevy and it was a green Buick and he wrote my license tag down wrong. Man, that thing should have been thrown out of court. But you know what? I didn't have the money to drive all the way back to Texas. Quit my job for two days, drive all the way back to Texas, sit in court all day long to find a speaking ticket. So you know what? Because I didn't have, I didn't, couldn't afford to do that, guess what? I ended up paying a $200 ticket. Why? Because I didn't have the money not to pay it. <laughs> So, and I mean, that's just a small example. If you got a lot of money, you can hire a lot of fluent lawyers and you can get out of a lot of things. But if you don't have the money, you're guilty. It's just that simple. Nothing's really changed. Listen, oh, uh, another thing that was uh, the same thing as it is now. This, uh, you, you know, God couldn't find a man that was strong enough in the faith to stand up and lead those people out of Egypt from inside those Israelites. Why wouldn't he pick somebody from right there in Israel? Because there was nobody that he could use out of Israel. It's hard to find a prophet that would stand up for, for God and for what was right. There was nobody that had the guts to stand up for God. And it's the same thing today. There's a lot of people, a lot of men and women that, that, that uh, claim God, but not a lot of them have the guts to stand up. Oh, Moses, he went and uh, murdered an Egyptian. You know the story of Moses. He murdered an Egyptian and got scared and ran off and went 200 miles to Goshen on the desert and, and stayed over there for 40 years. Well, when God decides to deliver Israel, God couldn't call somebody out of Israel because there was nobody there that had the guts. God had to go 200 miles away to get Moses to come all the way back over there and use Moses to lead his people out of Egypt. God could have used anybody, but he used Moses. So, things haven't changed a whole lot from then to now. Technology's changed. It's, uh, I think it's a little easier to sin now than it is then. Um, I think there's a lot of things that has changed, but basically, uh, our world system is all the same. So, having said that, I want to bring you back to the Israelites before they left. Now, keep in mind that these Israelites are not ready to leave the promised land. God had to get them ready, I mean, to leave the uh, uh, Egypt and go into the promised land. They're not ready. They don't want to leave. There's no nothing calling them out over there. So God had to convince the Egyptians to turn them loose and had to convince the Israelites to go. And one of the ways He convinced uh, them is through the plagues. And so, uh, well, we know the, the ten plagues. Each plague, God was really trying to 
um, discredit one of those Egyptian gods that they served. For instance, uh, Beelzebub was one of their gods. He's the god of the flies. He's the god that controls all the flies. You know, when you make these sacrifices, you can't allow no flies to get on their sacrifices to their gods, or their, their sacrifice is no good, and then God will get angry if you give them a sacrifice to God. And so they had a God that they prayed to, Beelzebub, that kept the flies off their sacrifices. You know? And so one of the uh, plagues that God sent on was the plague of flies. Amen? Now, that's kind of funny because Beelzebub wasn't able to keep all the flies away. Now, I'm sure you know what how nasty flies are. I mean, I, a while back I had looked on the internet and was checking them out. And I didn't know this. I wish I, I wish I still didn't know it. Sometimes too much information is not it, it, it's too much. But you know, them flies, they get on you and they, they vomit stuff out on you and then they lick it back up and then they spit it back out and they lick it back up. And that's why they spread diseases so much. So if a fly lands on you and you see him, you ever see his hands doing like this? That's because he's vomiting stuff out. He's picking it up and eating it again. But that's disgusting. Can you imagine millions and millions of those things? You know, it got to where now you're out there at a church fellowship dinner and you're sitting there eating a potato salad and the pulled pork and the fly gets over there on that cake. I don't even, I'm not even hungry anymore. You know? That's a shame. But that's a, I, I mean, that's, but that's when flies are nasty, man. Now, I wish I didn't know that about them flies. But the point being is, can you imagine billions of flies in your house, every in your food, when you're sleeping at night, you're buzzing around your head. I mean, we know that about mosquitoes. We're used to the mosquitoes, but can you imagine the flies? And I mean, and, and so uh, they had to turn to Moses to get rid of all that, you know? And so Moses prays and everything goes away. Everything's fine. But you know, when God sent the plague, when God sent that plague on them, on them uh, Egyptians, you know, and then I'm thinking, well, guess what? In the morning, there was no deliverance. They were still in bondage. Another one of their gods was the sun god. So, well, let me, let me talk about the frog first. Because the, the sun, the, the dark was the last. So, the, they had their uh, frogs. Frogs were, oh, I love frogs. Man, we went frog another night and they catch them on. That made me some mad. And I was thinking, man, Lord, could you play us just for one night? No, I didn't really. But they worshipped frogs. They bowed down to frogs and worshipped frogs. These frogs were, uh, they worshipped them because whenever you have a lot of frogs, that meant you have a lot of rain and uh, the rivers overflowed and it created ponds and, and, and that meant you had good vegetation. I mean, you had a good crop coming this year. And that's the reason why they worshipped frogs and they prayed to the frogs and they, they loved frogs for that simple reason. And so, whenever God sent the plague of the frogs, guess what? They learned how to hate frogs. You know, went to Moses and prayed that Moses would please look, go to God, go to your Jehovah God and have him stop the frogs. We don't want no more frogs. We got too many frogs here. And so Moses prayed to God and all the frogs went away. Then the morning time came. The next morning came, and guess what? They were still in bondage. And then and plague after plague after plague. And then another one of their gods is the sun god. And so God darkened the land. I mean, it was darker than it's ever been over there for days. It was dark. The sun never came out for days and days. It was dark. But you know what? When morning came, the Israelites were still in bondage. And then God says, listen, here's what I want you guys to do. I want you guys to go kill a lamb. And I want you to take that lamb. I want you to bleed him. And I want you to take that blood. I want you to put it on the doorpost. And there's going to be a death angel that's going to pass over there at night time. I know you've heard this story. I'm not telling you anything new. But I'm just trying to encourage you. And believe it or not, if it's somewhere in here, there's supposed to be a little bit of encouragement. So y'all just bear it with me. And whenever that death angel passes over, what's going to happen is the firstborn of every family is going to die unless they have that blood applied to the doorpost. So you apply that blood. Now, personally, I just believe this. I'll make it so, but I believe that even some of those Egyptians were smart enough to apply the blood. I believe that. <laughs> I believe that they had done seen the power of God and even some of the Egyptians did. That may or may not be so. I don't know. It's not. It's just a, a, I believe that. So they went and applied the blood to the doorpost. And that death angel passed by. When that death angel passed by and morning came, 
experience. They were delivered. Morning came. And for the first time in their life, they were delivered from bondage. They were delivered from that filthiness. For the first time in their life, with a whole heart, they were able to follow after God. With a whole heart, they were able to follow after God. Now listen, I know you don't have those kind of hindrances that those Israelites have. You don't have nobody beating your back and, and bleeding you and making you uh, make your own bricks and build your own buildings. You don't have that. I know that. But friends, I tell you what, I do know from personal experience that being a Christian is not an easy task. I know it does not make you healthier just getting saved. I know it does not heal cancer just because you're saved. I do believe that God can heal cancer. I believe sometimes He does it just for the simple purpose that He wants us to know that He is alive and that He is working, and I know He does it all the time. I know I've seen God do some awesome miracles. Some things. I've seen God do things that you couldn't blame on any other circumstances. You had to blame it on answer prayer. You had to. It's just that obvious. So I know God's able. But friends, being a Christian doesn't fix anything. It doesn't make you like it. Some people are going through some dark times today. I know there's dark days out there. I know there's people going through a lot of troubles. Some of it's spiritual troubles. Some of it's emotional troubles. Some of it's political trouble. Some of it's personal troubles. Some of it's uh, troubles that you don't want to talk about. Some other times you, but friends, I'm here to tell you something. I know one thing. I'm going to tell you something. Morning's coming, and Jesus Christ is coming back. And I can't imagine what it's going to be like whenever I look up into heaven and I can see Jesus Christ standing back on a cloud, standing there on a crowd, and all the saints of God's going to be standing there with, with a grin on their face standing from ear to ear. There's going to be millions of people standing up there just welcoming me in right there along with them. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, And the dead in Christ shall rise first, and those of us who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. First thing you're going to hear is you're going to hear a trump of God. And then you're going to hear uh, Michael the archangel. You're going to hear the voice of God. You're going to hear the trump of God. And friends, I'm going to tell you something. You're going to see dead people that's been dead for hundreds and some of them for thousands of years. And they're going to get up out of that old grave. And they're going to go meet their Lord and Savior in the air. That day's are coming. And then as soon as they're done, where if you're saved and you're in this church today and you're saved and and, and you're born again, and you're going to follow right in behind them. And you're going to be up there with the Lord forever. The Bible says, wherefore, comfort one another with those words. Your day is coming. I got up this morning and there was things hurting on me that I've never used to hurt before. Listen, I'm getting older and older. And the older I get, the slower I get. The more things go wrong, the harder it gets, the worse it gets. But friends, there's one thing that I can comfort to. There's one way that I can get comfort knowing that one day... and. Praise God, I hope it just is not the truth, but I may live to be 150 years old. Praise God, I don't want to listen nothing against nobody or anything. I don't want to live to be 80 years old. I never wanted to see 50. Whenever I got saved, I never even wanted to get to 50 years old. I wanted to be out of here already. You know, I got a birthday coming up. It's over 50. I hate that. I want to be in the Lord right now. I want to be home already. Get me out of here. Let's go. Amen. But if I tell you, and I'm here for 150 years. And I'm old crap. Listen, they'll probably my worst nightmares. They're going to put me in a nursing home somewhere. And they're going to pay some 15-year-old girl $5 an hour to come roll me over every 15 minutes because I'll get that sore. You know? You know, shut up. Quit complaining. Roll over. Here's your food. Open your mouth. Stuff it in. You know, here's your pot. All that good stuff. You know, that's my biggest fear. That I'm going to be able to take care of myself one day. I hate the thought of that. But if, listen, if the Lord tarries, and I live to be 150 years old. And my days are coming. Because God said that up there, when we get there to live with Him, there's not going to be no more crying. There's not going to be no tears. There's not going to be any pain. There's not going to be any suffering. All this that we know down here is going to be over with. No more bills to pay. No more children to worry over. No children to cry over. No more uh, nothing. It's all gone. It's done. Whatever is on your heart right now, whatever's burdening your heart right now, it's not going to burden you anymore. It's going to be done. It's going to be over with. And that's the reason why Jesus Christ came to this earth to give us that. When that preacher told me that everything's going to be okay, I misunderstood him. I thought it was going to be okay down here. But that's not what he was talking about. He was talking about, yeah, nothing to worry about. It's going to be okay up there. Your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life from now on. That's if you're a Christian. 
But if you're not a Christian, I would just like to go through a few verses very quickly with you, and then we're going to close this thing. First thing that I want to uh, give to you, just in case you're not saved, is, a, is the need to be saved. The need of salvation is simply this. Romans chapter 1, verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. 1 Thessalonians 1, 8, 9 says, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is a holy God and He punishes sin. If you're a Christian, listen, down here on this earth, your sins are going to find you out. There's consequences for your sins while you're here on this earth. Now, you will not have to pay for your sins eternally because Jesus Christ already paid for your sin. But if you're not saved today, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Bible says, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. Everlasting destruction. That's the Bible. That's what God says. God's a holy God and He punishes sin. Man is very sinful. And he's broken God's law. According to Romans chapter 5, verse 12, it says, Wherefore, as by one man sinned and entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Everybody's a sinner. Everybody is born into this world. If you're the most righteous person on the face of this earth, I got news for you. You're already against God when you was born. You was born in this world against God. It's in your blood. Sin's in your blood. Nothing you can do about the Bible. It says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And according to Galatians chapter 12 and verse 6, there's nothing you can do to get saved. There's nothing you can do to get saved. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh be justified. There's nothing you can do to be saved. If you're not saved in here today, there's nothing you can do to get saved. You're doomed. But you know what? Everything that needs to be done has already been done and Jesus Christ did. You can't get saved. Jesus Christ has already done what it takes for you to get saved. The way of salvation is simple. Romans chapter 3, 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all men that believe, there is no difference. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Salvation is a free gift. It costs nothing. So, we will give the invitation here in just a second. It's, it's, it's going to be pretty simple. Pretty simple. Let me ask you. Like the Israelites were in Egypt for all that time. Egypt always represents, if you look at the Bible, Egypt always represents sin and worldliness. And Israel always represented church and Christians. You look, those Israelites were in Egypt for a very long time. They, listen, there was a point when all them Jews, God called them Jews out for a specific purpose. The Jews are God's chosen people. And today, if you're saved, you're God's chosen people. You're a peculiar people. That don't mean that you're sinless. <clears throat> doesn't mean that you're perfect. My question to you today is, I don't know your situation. I don't know, some of you, most of you people have just met for the first time today. Are you saved? That's the first question. Are you saved? Do you know Jesus Christ? Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're going to heaven when you die? And if you are saved, let me ask you this. Are you backslidden? Is, is going to church just like it is to a bunch of people across the Most people that you run into in the world out there and other churches, it's a ritual. You go to church because you have to. You read your Bible because you have to. Because you're supposed to. Do. Or do you still love the Lord like you did when you first got saved? I mean, you, you know your relationship. You know how you are. But those Jews in Egypt, they were God's people. But were they fellowshipping with God? Understand the difference. And are you saved? And that's going to be the simple twofold invitation today. If you're not saved, I beg you. Come up here. Turn your life over to Jesus Christ. The Bible says by faith and not by works. All you have to do is come over here and let Jesus Christ just, just confess Him your sins. You don't have to tell us your sins. Just tell Jesus Christ how much you love Him. Tell Jesus Christ that you believe He died for your sins. Just ask Him into your heart to save you. 
and then live the rest of your life for Jesus Christ. It's pretty simple. You don't have to quit cussing. You don't have to quit smoking. You don't have to quit doing anything to get saved. Just get saved. Amen. Spend eternity in heaven. And dear Christian, if you need to get right with God, why not today? Why wait till tomorrow? Why wait till next year? Why wait till Jesus comes back to get right with God? Maybe you're going through some dark hours. Maybe it's physical. Maybe it's emotional. But maybe you're going through some dark stuff in your life. Maybe there's some, some darkness. Friends, come over here and just praise God for the dark hours. Because I'm going to tell you, uh, it's the darkest hour just before dawn. It's the darkest hour that God can bless you the most, the easiest, and the best. So when the invitation is our piano player comes up and gives the invitation, that's my call too. If everybody would stand, everybody bow your heads if you would.